Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Amen. Well, I've got a stack of birthdays here. Now, just saw them, so it's too late for me to get you a gift. <laughs> but Carrie LeBlanc and Marty had a birthday on Friday. Thank the Lord for that. Mark Monaco had a birthday on Tuesday. And Phyllis Kathy had a birthday has a birthday tomorrow and she's already opened her gift which was a RV. <laughs> and I don't know it would be a spoil sport, but I didn't get her a thing after that. <laughs> I'm glad they have it, you know. So bless the Lord for it. This morning, Jeremiah 17, first 10 verses. Judah's sins. And while we're covering this, you can exercise your pitchfork religion. In other words, when the word goes out, you just grab it and pitch it over whoever's behind you. <laughs> but as we examine Judah's sins, we will certainly see our own. Yes, President Calvin Coolidge came home from church one day and his wife asked him what the preacher had preached on and he said sin. And she said what did he say about it? Coolidge said well he was against it. Several years ago, Phil and I were listening to how certain preachers place the emphasis on a sentence and how they move that emphasis around. A man was preaching a revival service, and in the revival service, he started off and he said, What shall we do about sin? And then he went on to say, what shall we do about sin? His next quote was, what shall we do about sin? An old boy in the back stood up and shouted, nip it, nip it in the bud. <laughs> well, Jeremiah was against the sins of the people in this chapter. And he speaks of six sins that they were guilty of. Six sins that they were guilty of. He begins in the first four verses about idolatry. And instead of giving their love and their worship to the Lord who had blessed them, they honored the heathen gods. In the high places, in the hills, they built alt altars to various gods and obscene symbols to the goddess Asherah. All of this defiled the land and their God-given inheritance. They would lose everything that God had given them and it would be their fault. You see, God's holy law, which they knew, should have been written not in their minds, but written in their hearts. Proverbs 3, 3, 7, 3. They were commanded to hide his word in their hearts that they might not sin against him. But they're inscribed on our hearts until we ask him for forgiveness 
and he then cleanses our hearts and makes them brand new. That's what 1 John 1, 7 says, 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And the Apostle John's last sermon, last admonition to us, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. 1 John 5. Last thing. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. You know, well, we think I can pass on that one. I don't have an idol in my house. I don't have an idol in my yard, so evidently I'm free on this one. But what about money? Have you made it an idol? What about fame and success and power and pleasure and achievement and more? In other words, how much is there out there that you love more than you do the Lord Jesus? How much more that's out there? Demas hath forsaken us, is what Paul wrote, having loved this present world more than the things of God. Doesn't say that he didn't love God. Said that there was so much out there that he loved more than God. Well, how do you know that we love God more than the things of the world? Well, think about it. How do you determine that? Now, I've, said, I've heard some people say, well, open your checkbook and run the register. That was real quiet. Amen. <laughs> What thoughts, in other words, flood your mind the most? And about whom? What is it that shows you the things that you love more than the things of the Lord? Well, in verses 5 through 10, we see the unbelief. And it's really sad to say, but the Jewish leaders lean to their political allies rather than leaning upon the Lord. And the fifth verse here shows how serious that God takes this. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. Think about this. Unbelief turns life into a barren wasteland. Unbelief does. Faith turns it into a fruitful orchard. Deceptive, isn't it? Warren Wiersbe, who is, to me, one of the best, if you ever want to start really studying the Word of God, you, in our bookstore, we have what he wrote and called his B series, B-E. And in James, the book would be entitled Be Mature. Philippians, it would be Be Joyful, and so on and so forth. And it's his B series. But Warren Wisby wrote, and he said, the heart of every problem is the problem in the heart. The heart of every problem is the problem in the heart. And the human heart is deceitful. In our text, 17, 9, and 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing." You ever had somebody say, well, if I know my own heart, well, if I know my own heart on the matter, the problem is we don't know our own heart. You want to know what your heart is like? If you want to, you have to read the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit lead. Let the Holy Spirit reveal. But you know, in our lives, Either the Word of God will reveal the sin, or sin will keep us from the Word of God. 
The Jewish people were like us. They were long on unbelief and short on faith. In fact, I think they set the record, Brad, for unbelief. I mean, 40 years wandering in the wilderness, that's uh, pretty much a record of unbelief. They long on it. And God had blessed them in so many ways, and they didn't believe. But the question today is, how long will you wander in the wilderness before you decide to really trust the Lord, to really live for the Lord? You know, the scripture says some of you are very close to the kingdom. In other words, you're, you're seeking, you're searching, you're close to the kingdom. But you need to go all the way. You need to go all the way with him. Well, Jeremiah speaks about greed. In verse 11, As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. The rich exploited the poor, became richer, and the courts did nothing about it. Since the rodeo's just now concluded, <laughs> that was your outside voice. I think of what an old cowboy told me. He said, a good deal isn't a good deal unless it's good for both people. Well, I think of old Mr. Zachary. Uh, I used to have to work for a living. And I was in the grocery business. And uh, I learned a lot from that old man. When I was with Labatt, the grocery company, and he would call up and want a trailer load of groceries. Didn't ask about the price or anything because he had a crew going over to Saudi Arabia or whatever. And let me tell you something. He said froggy and we said rivet. <laughs> and how high would we jump? Because he ma made it profitable for us. And one of his sayings was, leave enough on the table for the next guy. Because when you need him, he's going to remember that. So he never tried to skin us. He gave us a fair price for good product. Well, Jeremiah said in the 6th chapter, the 13th verse, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one, listen to that, Everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone, everyone dealeth falsely. That was a condition of the land. And you know, sometimes we're guilty of attributing greed and covetousness as the sin of the wealthy. But just as often, it's a sin of the poor. Because sometimes the wealthy, they're not coveting anything because they've got it all. <laughs> you know, they're not coveting it. But sometimes the person at the convenience store that's buying the lotto ticket is wanting to win something to give them everything that the wealthy have. You know, the scripture says, Paul speaking, says, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content. I've heard others say that's why we know for sure he wasn't a Texan. <laughs> but whatever state we're in, to be content. Well, forsaking the Lord. What good would their wealth be? wealth be when the judgment fell. But then they forsook the Lord on top of everything else. 
a glorious high throne from the beginning of the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. It's interesting that the throne of Judah was stained with sin and clouded by shame, but God's throne was glorious. God's throne was exalted. The Jew put a lot of emphasis on the physical, but not so much on the spiritual. I don't think things have changed very much in these several thousand years. They were more concerned about the instruments of the temple rather than the service to the temple. Now I think and it really doesn't matter what I think, but I think we take pretty fair concern over this tin tabernacle that the Lord's given us, and we should. He gave it to us, so we need to take care of it, and keep it fixed up, cleaned up, and everything. But you know, you can go to the point where there's people more concerned about the physical attributes of the temple than they are the spiritual attributes. And we can have something slick and shiny and if our hearts are far from him, it, it doesn't make any difference. But that's no sign that you girls can't clean it, okay? <laughs> well, in the New Testament, Paul tried so hard to convey these feelings. Second Corinthians 5, he wrote things like, For we know that if our earthly tabernacle, or this tabernacle, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he says, as long as we live here, we'll be burdened. <laughs> now, Brad and I had a discussion about that. You know, as long as we live here, we're going to have some affliction. I don't know why this happened. I don't know why that happened. I don't know. As long as we live here, we're going to have burdens. You know, sometimes I think that that's the Lord's way of making us homesick for heaven. You reckon? I think that's why my aunt, as 95 years old, said, Butch, when's the Lord going to take me home? I said, you got your way for 95 years. My grandfather spoiled you. Your husband spoiled you. And now it's fallen upon me to spoil you. But I'm telling you this, God's going to come get you when he's ready, not when you're ready. And I think the Lord lets us get to that point. We'd rather just go on and be with Jesus. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we don't get so content. We don't drive our tent stakes so deep here that where we forget about where our home is. Well, he says, as long as we live here, we'll be burdened. Our lives here are temporal, but there, they're going to be eternal. Now, the scripture talks about rejecting God's service. Verse 14 through 18, this is the fourth personal prayer that Jeremiah ushered up. And this one was for himself. <laughs> he prayed for personal safety. He prayed for protection. And there's prayer, and there's prayer for safety and protection. You do know the difference, don't you? You have experienced the difference, I trust. Jonah and I, one time late at night, in the Arab sector 
Arab neighborhood of over 100,000 in East Jerusalem missed the last taxi. And we were courteous to a fault. If I'd have known what followed, I'd have pushed down three old ladies and jumped in that last cab. <laughs> That's not so. I'd have let Joni do it. <laughs> but here we were in East Jerusalem. And everybody that late at night looked at us as we were a terrorist instead of them. And we prayed. And, and when you're walking, you don't have a navvy. And so we're walking, trying to find our way back to the King David Hotel. And uh, it was a scary time. We did stop and pray for safety and protection. Get us back to the hotel, please, Lord. I remember another time flying into Lagos, Nigeria. And they had militant Muslims that were trying to stone us. I wanted them to get to know me. And, and, and we could be best buds and they wanted to kill us. And I thank the Lord for the two angels that we had on the bus with submachine guns. And as soon as they went and they scattered, that was my two best friends. <laughs> Michael was one of them. Gabriel was the other one. I said here, Michael here, Gabriel here, and let those other 30 pastors do the best they could. <laughs> but yes, you know, but we prayed, we prayed. I think of Uganda in the National Forest, and that's when the Congolese were raiding. And when I'm talking about raiding, they were raiding. And uh, I'm not the most patient person in the world. Maybe, let me get away from here. I am a, not patient at all. And we get there, and we get to a crossbar. And there's two trucks. There's a Toyota and our Nissan. And the bar went up, and the Toyota took off, three people in it. And the bar came down. And my sarcasm just went into gear right there. I said, what in the world? Do they think this is a traffic jam or what? They lifted up the bar, one truck goes through, it goes down, and we're sitting there. And I said, I can't believe this. I turned to the missionary and I said, what do they think, that they're going to show us who's in control and who isn't? He didn't say a word. I said, what is the purpose for all of this? I said, the, the Toyota's about three miles up there. I can see it on the hill. He said, they're holding us back to see if they're attacked by the Congolese army so that we could make it back to the deal. What I did then was pray for protection and safety, not wanting something to happen. Then we, they said, okay, we're gonna go, but we won't be on the one paved road that they have in Uganda. It runs north and south. We're going to have to drive through the National Forest. Man, I was like a six-year-old in a finger paint contest. I would just, we're going to go through the National Forest, and I'm going to get to see a giraffe and an elephant and maybe a lion. I, I was so excited until we're heading down the path, and all of a sudden, there's a cloud of dust, and the pickup rocks to the left and rocks to the right and it's bouncing back and forth and you couldn't see anything out of any window. And we just sat there. And all of a sudden the dust settled and there's 40 mama cow 
buffaloes over here. And I looked on the other side, and there's 40 more on this side, and they had the calves behind them. And not one of them hit the truck in all of that. Because I was praying for protection <laughs> and safety. I didn't want word coming home to Joan saying, we've got your husband, but he's wrapped up in what appears to be aluminum foil. <laughs> but it's a Nissan. I've been in Brazil where they had the African cults, Shango, Macau, and Kundumble. And we'd be walking through the villages at night, 5,000 miles from home, and all I heard was boom, 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 boom. And what I did was prayed for protection and safety. But you don't have to go that far. I had led a little Hispanic lady to the Lord, probably with a sixth grade education. And I'm going to tell you her name in case you ever see her. I want you to either buy her lunch or do whatever God prompts you to do. But her name was Eva Luscar. And when she accepted the Lord, she was saved all over. But what she would do, she would invite me to go to a party at one of her relatives' houses on the west side of San Antonio at night. And there'd be a guy that had more tattoos than I've got hair on my arm. And uh, she'd say, Pastor, I want you to talk to Jesse. Jesse's lost and he's going to hell. And then she'd go off to get something to eat. <laughs> and I would say, hi, Jesse. <laughs> and if I managed to get through that, if I managed to get through that, I'd, I'd be over somewhere else. And she'd bring me back, talk to more about Jesse, about being saved. Because Jesse's lost. He'd flex his muscles like that, and I'd look down at mine, and I prayed for safety and protection. She had no fear. You know, sometimes we get in those spots that we just say, Lord, help us. Get us out of here whole. Let me run away to talk again another day. <laughs> But what Jeremiah didn't run away. He had a fervent prayer for safety and protection. He didn't run away. He faithfully delivered God's messages. But he needed God's help and protection. And God answered his prayers. Well, they talk about profaning the Sabbath. Verse 19 through 27. God had given the Sabbath to his covenant people for a time of rest. Them, their animals, their livelihood. They were told to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But we need to remember that Saturday is the Sabbath. And Sunday is the Lord's Day. Not the last day of the week, but the first day of the week. And that's why we worship on the first day of the week, because on the first day of the week, Jesus rose again. But they defiled it in much the same way that we do the Lord's Day. For them, neglecting the Sabbath was another way to get more. Six days wasn't enough. There was a greed there to get more. Years ago, I had a friend in the heavy equipment business, and he worked a lot of hours. 
and he got a lot of overtime, time and a half. But on Sundays, he got double time. And it was a tremendous amount of money, what he worked on Sundays. But he told me, he said, you know, the more I work on Sundays, I'm tempted to work more. It's such an easy way to make a lot of money in a short period of time. But what he did then, to keep from being tempted, whatever he made double time, he gave that to the Lord. All the double time. Now, I'm not saying that we all, that everybody does that, but that was his way of fighting temptation. And Satan will know what you're tempted of. You know it? I've said it before, and I got in trouble before, so I'll get in trouble again, but Satan knows what to tempt you with. You could put enough drugs on that piano that a show horse couldn't jump over it. Wouldn't bother me a bit. My temptation might be to how to sell it without <laughs> incurring a lot of cost packaging it. I said that and I was severely chastised by one of the mothers whose kid was selling it. But the devil knows what you're tempted by. And what tempts me may not tempt you. What tempts you may not tempt somebody else. But Satan knows what it is, and, and that's where he'll hit you. That's where he'll work you. And sometimes you think, well, I've got this under control now. Look out. He that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. We are where we are by the grace of God, and we thank him for it. Well, the Lord didn't want a me mechanical response to the law. He wanted it to come from the heart. The heart. The heart. That's where he wanted it to come from. In Isaiah 29, Matthew 15, the Lord said, These draw near me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's a somewhat haunting verse, isn't it? These follow me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. On the outward, it looks pretty good. But the Lord looks on the heart on the inside. Verse 27 talks about living in an age of unconcern. That's where Jeremiah was. They weren't concerned no matter how hard he preached, no matter how faithful he was. They were not concerned. Just look around you. Now, I love sports, but only to a degree. When Sunday football takes precedence over, precedence over Sunday worship, Something is radically wrong. When Sunday soccer fields are full and Sunday schools are empty, something is radically wrong. We're living in an age of unconcern. So what do we do? Well, Ephesians 6.10 is a good place to start. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness and high prices. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about, girt about with truth, 
having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel to which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The battle, the armor, and it says three times to stand. Not that you just have it here, that you have it here. That I may speak boldly. When's the last time you prayed that you'd speak boldly? Not about the irritants that are taking place in your life. But Lord, would you give me the power, the spirit to speak boldly. God's got a plan for every life here. And that plan begins with salvation. People being born again people being saved by the Spirit of God. You see, when we have the invitation, sometimes I feel defeated, but the Holy Spirit's never defeated. The Word of God says that it will always, it will always accomplish that for which he sent it forth. And the Holy Spirit will take the Word of God and deal with the people exactly where you're at. I don't know where you're at. You don't know where I'm at. But the Holy Spirit of God knows where we're both at. And so today, if you're not saved, you can be saved. That's, that's the greatest good news I can think of. That right where you're at, you can bow the knees of your heart. Ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin and to come into your heart and life and save you. And upon the authority of his word, he'll do just that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then when you're saved, you're going to want to make it public. You're going to want to share. You're going to want to follow the Lord as these did in scriptural baptism. You're going to want to be a part of a local Bible believe in church and we make that decision openly and publicly you come we pray with you lift it up to the Lord and the people are thrilled with your decision would you stand and pray with us